So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Matthew Thun. Um, he is um, an assistant professor at CMU at the moment in computer science. He focuses on computational imaging. And uh, before he joined CMU, he was a postdoc at Stanford University at Gordon. And uh, he did his PhD at the University of Toronto. He's going to talk about uh, imaging the world on, on photo and at the time. Great. Thank you for the introduction. Thanks for having me here. Uh, switch over to sharing my screen. Are you able to see my screen? So uh, you're on mute. I'll assume that you can see my screen. Uh, OK, great. So again, thanks for having me. I'm part of the Robotics Institute and Computer Science Department here at Carnegie Mellon. And I work in computational imaging. So this is a topic that finds itself at the intersection of computer graphics and computer vision. And the idea behind computational imaging is to find new ways to capture or display visual information. And this often is done by thinking about how to change the hardware and the software that goes into cameras and displays to do just this. So, let me give you a few examples of what I mean by computational cameras. So computational cameras can include devices like HDR cameras, super resolution cameras, and light field cameras. These are devices that allow you to capture visual information that a normal camera would maybe not allow you to do. So HDR imaging is an example of a technique that is actually, uh, you can find on most smartphones nowadays. And it's a technique that allows you to capture more detail in the bright areas of a scene and the dark areas of a scene. And this is done by capturing multiple images under different exposure settings and then combining the images to produce a, a better one. And super resolution displays is an example of a display that allows you to get high resolution images from low resolution sensors. And light field imaging is a really interesting topic. It allows you to do uh, post-processing on images, uh, which includes being able to refocus images after they've already been captured. And a lot of these ideas also extend towards displays. So there are HDR displays, super resolution displays, and light field displays. So light field displays is an example of a display where you can see 3D content without the need for special glasses like those that you wear in the theater. Now, my personal area um, actually happens to lie at the intersection of these, these two spaces. So I really like to think about designing computational lights or displays and computational cameras in order to analyze the way light interacts with the world. So I, an example of this is projector camera systems, using projectors to send light patterns into the world and cameras to pick up the light that comes back in response, and then try to use that information in order to figure out the 3D shape of objects within the world or try to learn about their material appearance. And for today, I'm going to focus on a very specific type of active imaging um, that involves a picosecond laser and a sensor known as a SPAD. So a SPAD is a very special type of sensor. So unlike a normal camera pixel, which collects lots of photons and then reads out a value between 0 and 255 that indicates how many photons were captured during a, a specific exposure period, a SPAD can detect individual photon events. And here's how it works. So usually you pair these up with a picosecond laser, which can be used to send a pulse of light into an environment. That light will bounce around within the environment, interacting with different objects, and then some of that light will make its way over to this SPAD sensor. And in this case, I'm just going to indicate that the SPAD sensor here is a single pixel sensor. And that single pixel will trigger an event once a photon actually hits that sensor. So it can detect individual photon events. And every time a photon is detected, a timestamp is generated. So this timestamp is created by looking at the last time the picosecond laser sent out a pulse and when the photon was actually detected at the sensor. The time difference between the two tells you how much time it took for that photon to travel through the environment and reach your sensor. Now, one photon of information is not all that useful. So you can repeat this process millions of times a second in order to capture a distribution of photon arrival times. So rather than 
just capturing that one photon that arrives at that one instant, you can capture a range of different photons, each one traveling through the scene along different light paths, interacting with different objects before reaching the sensor. And so you get this in temporal information out of these SPAD sensors that can be useful for a number of different applications. Now, two of the SPADs that I've been using over the past couple of years at Stanford um, include this MPD SPAD and this Lino SPAD on the right. The MPD is a single pixel SPAD, and it offers a pretty nice temporal resolution in terms of the timing precision on when did those photons actually hit the sensor. Uh, basically, you can detect these photons with an accuracy of about 60 picoseconds, which corresponds to 1.8 centimeters, meaning that the pulse that you see coming out from the scene will have about a thickness of 1.8 centimeters. The little SPAD is another SPAD that I've been using and I'll talk about later on throughout this talk that consists of a linear array of SPAD pixels. So you can have more than just one SPAD pixel. You can have, of course, many of them, like a regular sensor. Uh, the trade-off in this case is that there's a uh, higher jitter associated with this particular sensor, around 300 picoseconds, which means that the pulses that you detect are approximately nine centimeters in width. Now, for this talk, I'm going to focus on three applications that I've been looking at closely with the, uh, that can make use of these SPAD sensors. The first is this idea of transient imaging. Transient imaging is a concept that has existed for a while, but it was uh, recently, uh, 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 there's recent work in 2011 that gave rise to a lot of uh, new work in this in the space of transient imaging. And the idea here is to try to capture the transient nature of light, to observe light as it's propagating through a scene at the speed of light. And this information can be used for a number of different applications, including single photon 3D imaging. So single photon 3D imaging is looking at capturing 3D shape with some of these sensors and looking at to ways to do that in extreme scenarios where you might have only one photon of information available to you per pixel. And by using uh, some interesting denoising procedures, we can extract the depth information from these very, very, uh, these data sets that consist of very few photons. And last, I'm going to focus on some recent work uh, on non-line of sight imaging, where the goal is to basically capture 3D shape once again, but do so in a, in a scenario where you have no direct access to the object that you're trying to image. That is, the object here might be hidden behind an occluder. And non-line of sight imaging uses walls or other surfaces and turns them into diffuse mirrors in order to see these objects that are hidden from sight. Now I'm going to start off with this concept of transient imaging. So I first came across this in 2011, when uh, Ramesh Raskar gave a talk here in Pittsburgh, in fact, at a conference called ICCP, the International Conference on Computational Photography. And he showed this video of a pulse of light traveling through a Coke bottle at trillions of frames per second. So the camera that captured this light propagating through this Coke bottle uh, is able to extract this information from a scene, showing how light is bouncing around through a scene and interacting with this Coke bottle in various different ways. So this particular Coke bottle is filled with a little bit of uh, milk, causing it to scatter. So you can see the light pulse passing through the Coke bottle. When it hits the cap here, it produces all these ripples of light that are traveling through a scene. And all this information is very useful to uh, someone that's in computer vision or computer graphics because you can start to think about how to pry that information out of these images or these these video sequences and learn about aspects of the scene that may otherwise be hidden to you. So it gives you a new dimension of information for analyzing scenes. The challenge has been that those sensors are extremely expensive and are extremely slow. So recently, we've been looking at trying to build these transient cameras using SPADs. So SPADs are much cheaper to, uh, to build, and they're a lot easier to use. And here's an example of an output captured with a SPAD camera. Now, this, is, this scene here might look a little bit complex, but it consists of basically two elements. It consists of a glowing fiber optic cable, which is actually really just a toy. It's designed to light up when you put a light source on one end. 
So we attached a picosecond laser to one end, and that lights up the entire cable. Now, using our SPAD sensor, we can measure not just the intensity at different points within the scene to produce this regular image, but we can also measure the time it took for light to travel through the scene from the picosecond laser through the fiber and to our camera. And this video sequence shows exactly that. So light starts at this laser and then propagates through and eventually exits the fiber at the other end. And what's interesting here is that you can see all sorts of effects going on. So if you look closely at the bottom of the video, uh, you can see the bottom lights up. That's due to diffuse reflections, light escaping the fiber, hitting other parts of the scene and reaching the camera. Also, when the pulse enters the fiber, it actually starts out being pretty sharp, around 90 centimeters width. And then as it propagates through the fiber, it actually elongates. This is due to the fact that the fiber is relatively thick. And a property of these fibers is that it elongates the pulse that's traveling through it. Now, there are a number of different transient cameras that capture images like this. And the first of which actually was presented in 1987. And this was a holographic technique used to capture this type of information. And more recently, uh, one of my colleagues here at CMU, Yanis Gulakas, has proposed to use a Michaels interferometer to capture light as it propagates through a scene using these interferometric techniques. One of the big challenges, though, with these interferometric techniques is the fact that you need to be very conscious of the vibrations that exist in your environment. So this is usually done on a optically isolated or vibration isolated table in a basement in a dark room over long periods of time. Now, we want to do this at uh, uh, more reasonable rates and under, uh, well, get around these vibration limitations. So in 2011, Ramesh Raskar and, and Andreas Velten had proposed using these street cameras in order to capture this information. Now, street cameras uh, are the one that produced that Coke bottle video that I just showed you. And the challenge with these street cameras, however, is that they're both extremely expensive and extremely bulky. So just to give you an idea of how much you might need to pay to get one of these cameras in your lab, it ranges between half a million and a million dollars for the camera and laser. So um, it, it makes it hard to make use of these cameras uh, just because of the expense, not to mention the fact that it takes a, about half an optical table in order to, to install it. So there have been a lot of work on trying to reduce the cost and uh, the robustness of these sensors. And there's been some works in developing transient cameras based off of uh, regular time of flight sensors. One sensor includes these PMD sensors, or photonic mixer devices, which are the types of sensors that are used in the Microsoft Connect 2, for example. Now, these sensors are really designed to capture depth maps, not transient images. And so there's some challenges in trying to capture not just the direct reflection to the scene, which gives you depth, but the light that might be scattering a little bit later in time. So I'm going to focus on these SPADs for capturing this type of information. So in this case, we're going to use the little SPAD, which is that array of SPAD pixels. And we're going to capture the light from a picosecond laser, just like before. But this time, we're going to measure it at not just at one location, but have multiple SPADs looking at different points within the scene. Now, every SPAD produces a timestamp event, and you can accumulate these histograms, 256 histograms in this case, for 256 pixels. Each histogram gives you a temporal response function of the scene, so how the scene reacts temporally to a pulse of light. And the little SPAD will output these spatial temporal images, where one axis represents spatial information, and the other axis represents temporal information. So this gives us a spatial temporal slice of a scene. And we can use this as a way to capture one slice of our transient image. So on the right here, we have a scan line, which represents where we're positioning the sensor over time. And on the left, we're building up this transient image by capturing these spatial temporal images one at a time, and then concatenating them along the third dimension to extract not just uh, what, uh, the dimensions y in time, but we're also getting 
dimensions in X as well. So we have two dimensions representing space and one dimension representing time. And from this volume, we can slice it up along the time axis to basically play back a video of light propagating through optical fibers. And all of this is done in approximately one minute in this case. But recently, uh, some uh, my co-author and I, uh, David Lindell, as, long, uh, as well as Gordon Wettstein at Stanford, uh, have made some improvements on the speed of these uh, cameras. So we can capture this information in less than a second. Now, in this video sequence, these are video sequences that were captured on the order of about a minute, in this case. And even with about a minute of exposure time, you still have quite a bit of noise in the unprocessed measurements shown here. So we had been exploring ways to try to denoise and de-blur the measurements here. So the, as I mentioned before, the pulses here are about one centimeter, uh, sorry, not one centimeter, nine centimeters in length. And uh, you get uh, fairly noisy measurements. And so you need to develop strategies to, before you can process these images, to denoise and deblur these images using the temporal characteristics of your SPAD as well as the noise characteristics of our SPAD. So we had developed a number of algorithms to try to understand how to denoise these images in, in a way that allows us to get uh, processed versions of that transient image, which are more suitable for transient imaging in general. So we can use these transient images uh, for a number of different applications, but I'm going to focus on using these transient images for capturing shape. And I'm going to do it in these two contexts. One is trying to capture shape where you only have about one photon of information coming back per pixel on average. And another case where we want to, in the case of non light imaging, image objects that are hidden from sight. So let's start with these single photon 3D sensors. And the idea of capturing shape using these time of flight sensors is exactly what a LIDAR does today. So LIDARs are light detection and raging systems that you can often find on the top of autonomous cars or self-driving cars. And these sensors, they're designed to capture point clouds of information. So here's a point cloud that's being generated at real-time rates. It's fairly sparse here, but every point in this point cloud represents the basically a 3D point within your environment. And this 3D point is captured by sending out light into the environment and measuring the time it takes for that light to come back to a sensor. So here's an illustration of how these LIDARs work again. So here are LIDARs at the top of the car. And the goal is to basically send out these pulses of light into a scene in order to measure the time it takes for light to come back. And we can use the time of arrival in order to figure out how far that target was from our sensor. Now, we need to repeat this multiple times for every point or every direction within the scene to build up a, a full point cloud representing 360 degrees of information. So here I'm just showing you the output uh, associated with pointing the LIDAR in a very specific direction. But that's all we need to do. So if you have this uh, signal coming back at a particular time, you can just look at what the arrival time for that photon was, or photons in this case, and then use the time of arrival to figure out distance travel, which tells you how far a target is. OK, great. So let's try moving the target back a little bit further. And maybe you have a, a sunlight now uh, directly casting light onto the object as well. And if we were to repeat the process, you get a different result. Uh, so what's happened now is that because the target's further away, you have fewer photons coming back. Also, because you have ambient light that's present, you get a lot of spurious photons, which is basically noise. Now, the goal here is, well, we still want to capture 3D shape, but it becomes a lot more challenging because you, you have many more photons to deal with. Some of these photons are due to ambient light, and one, in this case, might be due to the light reflecting off the target. So the focus here is to try to figure out ways to denoise this data in order to pull out the 3D shape from very noisy uh, LiDAR data or SPAD data. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail as to the differences between how existing LiDARs function and how SPADs function, but there is a, a somewhat of a difference between the sensors that are used in LiDARs and the ones that are used in SPADs. So LiDAR sensors are known as avalanche photodiodes, and they are basically working uh, in linear mode. So it, it captures a bunch of photons all at once. And as a result, you need to have a lot more light 
going into the scene in order to be able to detect the light that's coming back and timestamp it. One of the advantages of the SPAD is that it's able to detect the shape of objects that are further away. So that's the difference at a high level. Uh, and I just note for the record that uh, there are a number of LiDAR companies that exist today. And the last number that was told uh, to me was uh, there's around 37 LiDAR startup companies that exist. And some are exploring the use of these SPAD sensors to try to get LiDARs to perform at higher resolutions and longer ranges and, and at, at faster speeds. Now, the reason why we can't just crank up the laser power for these LiDAR systems is because if you crank up the laser power, it, became, it becomes a, a hazard for the eyes. So as a result, there's a limit or a cap on the amount of light that you can put into the scene. Then given that amount of light, you have a trade-off between what is the range that you want to image at, what is the acquisition speed, and what's the resolution of your point clouds that you're generating. And the goal here is to try to figure out a way to uh, use these SPAD sensors to push the limits of active 3D imaging using these time-of-flight sensors. Now, this concept of using SPADs for 3D imaging in very low-flux scenarios was first introduced by Kermani et al. in 2012 in a paper called First Photon Imaging. And in that paper, they basically capture these very sparse histograms of information where you have a few photons due to a laser that you're sending light uh, into the a scene with, and a few spurious random photons due to ambient light that's also present within the scene. And the goal here is to try to figure out a way to identify the laser photons and basically filter out or censor out the noise and ambient photons that are present here. So by identifying clustering of photons that might exist a specific temporal uh, location, you can start to disambiguate between the laser photons and ambient photons. So ambient photons, for example, will be randomly distributed across time because it's the light arrives at random intervals. Now, the light from our laser will be clustered at a specific time instant, and that's because the SPAD, in this case, is synchronized with the light that we're putting into the scene. And so we can use this information to help us try to uh, distinguish between these laser photons and ambient photons. Then the next step is to try to find ways to improve upon the resolution of the depth measurements from these photons. So you might have a few photons that are spanning uh, a variety of time uh, values, and this is due to the width of the pulse. And the goal here is to try to use both spatial and temporal priors on the uh, information that you're capturing and the geometry that you're trying to recover in order to produce a better depth map. Now, the techniques that have been proposed first by Kermani et al. and follow-up work by uh, their group uh, involves a number of different algorithms that tend to be very heuristic. And they can often fail depending on the amount of signal that's coming back and the amount of ambient light that's present. And it's because it's a very challenging problem. You have, in extreme cases, lots of ambient photons to deal with. And you're trying to maybe identify just one photon of laser light that's coming back to your sensor. And so we want to take a slightly different approach here. We were exploring how we can maybe use both the, uh, the histogram or transient information captured with a SPAD, shown in the bottom left, which is, again, another transient video here being captured at a rate of 20 hertz. And we wanted to see ways to fuse this information with more conventional um, sensor information, including an intensity image. And the, the idea here is that maybe this intensity image can help us figure out which photons detected within this transient image correspond to our laser source and which ones can, uh, are due to an ambient light source within our environment. Now, fusing these two together it cannot be done in a simple way. And so our approach has been to basically develop a convolutional neural network to try to take as input this intensity image and as input this transient image fuse them together in order to produce a 3D representation of our scene in cases where you only have about one laser photon per pixel. So the way we did this was we basically used conventional data sets that represent intensity and depth uh, 
measurements of a scene and use these data sets to simulate SPAD measurements. We then use these simulated SPAD measurements combined with the ground truth depth and intensity in order to train our convolutional neural network to take as input these noisy histograms and these noisy or, or and these intensity images and then output basically a, uh, a representation of where the pulse should have been within the scene. So here's an illustration of what I mean. So on the left here, we have a histogram representing noisy detections. So a few of these photons are due to our laser light source. A number of these photons are due to ambient light that's present as well. And what I'm not showing here is that we also include an intensity image. And the, we try to train a convolutional neural network to take this as input and then output this uh, histogram where it's basically, we basically remove the ambient component and we fit a pulse to the data. And we're training this by comparing the output of these CNNs to our ground truth pulse, which are uh, represented by the, uh, the depth maps that, we've, uh, that are within our database. And we use a KL divergence loss uh, function in order to do this comparison here. And we've tested a number of different architectures in order to see how we can use or make use of both the SPAD measurements and intensity images. So there are three architectures that we've used. The first one uh, that we tried using was to just make use of a traditional CNN, a 3D uh, CNN, to denoise the SPAD measurements. So we completely ignored the use of the intensity image in this case. I'm not going to go into too much details here, but the point is that uh, we take these SPAD, image, uh, SPAD measurements as a 3D volume as input. We, do, uh, 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 we implement this 3D CNN to process that volume, and this results in uh, an output volume where we then apply an argmax algorithm to figure out what is the depth value associated with uh, this, this volume. So there's going to be some pixels along the time axis that will uh, have highest intensity, and that will indicate what is the depth associated with that particular scene. Now, if we want to use the intensity image, we can try to plug this intensity image into our convolutional network. So we take the intensity image in as input, we downsample it to a size which is compatible with the resolution of our SPAD measurements, and then concatenate that into one of the layers within our convolutional neural network, and that allows us to take advantage of uh, the information that's present within the, uh, the intensity image to help us through this denoising process. Now, because the intensity image is also a high resolution image and our SPAD measurements tend to be relatively low resolution, uh, in this case, the uh, SPAD measurements are 64 by 64 in spatial dimensions, we can use the intensity image to not only help us denoise the depth measurements, but we can also use it to produce a higher resolution depth measurement. So we also pass this intensity image and construct this guided up sampling branch to our neural network in order to take that intensity image and help us learn a upsampled depth map of the scene in order to get a denser representation of the geometry within our environment. So here's some examples of uh, uh, a simulated uh, depth and intensity image. And we use these uh, depth and intensity images to produce a basically a noisy point cloud representing the transient image that was captured from a scene. So in this case, this is our transient image. So it's spatial dimensions x and y, and then the third dimension is time, like before. And here we have about two laser photons arriving per pixel on average, and about 50 ambient photons. So you have a lot more ambient light here in this case. And so you need to take advantage of spatial information uh, that might exist within the scene. So spatial clustering of photon arrival times to help us denoise this volume. And that's exactly what the convolutional network does. Now there are, as I mentioned, a number of different techniques to try to denoise this. The first that we tested was this log match filter approach, which is a per pixel approach. So it just uh, processes one histogram of information at a time, one temporal histogram of information at a time. And because it's ignoring spatial priors, it, it doesn't do all that well. Now, some of the methods by Shin et al., which followed up on the work and uh, this initial work on first photon imaging, is very sensitive to um, the 
ambient light that's present here. So if you have too much ambient light, Shin et al. doesn't work at all in this, in this particular case. They have some more recent work that actually does fairly well. And it's able to, from a very noisy uh, cloud of photon arrival times, produce a depth map that, that does pretty well. But there are some artifacts here, which I'll point out a little bit. Our CNN-based approach combines the output from our SPAD with an intensity image and allows us to basically fill in the gaps that are missed by wrapping Goyal's method. So specifically, there's regions within the scene where there might be no photons that are detected at all for these particular objects, or very few photons, I should say. And so the intensity image can help us in these cases basically bridge the gap in order to handle situations where you might not have that many photons to work with in order to recover this depth map. Here's another example of a scene that we've simulated. So we simulated again the measurements and there's around two photons arriving per pixel on average and about 50 ambient photons. Your log match filter uh, again, doesn't do so well because it's not taking advantage of spatial information here. Rapin Goyal uses uh, information across spatial regions within this image in order to help improve the denoising procedure. But the result is that you end up smoothing areas where there should be depth discontinuities. So, for example, the windows in the background here should have a different value than the window uh, and than the and the foreground here. Now, our CNN without an intensity image is able to recover a reasonably, reasonably good uh, depth map here. Uh, it tends to be fairly noisy in certain regions, as you can see here. And that's where it, our intensity image can really, really help. So our intensity image can basically fill the gap and allows us to get pretty good uh, depth reconstructions uh, all around here in this particular case. So we want to actually see whether this worked in practice. So we uh, worked with our Linospad once again and built a system to scan out these point clouds information or photon clouds information at real time rates. So this system works by scanning again a vertical scan line, one scan line at a time. Since we have a linear array of SPAD pixels, we can only image one scan line at a time. And we use a laser in this case to illuminate that scan line. So we take the laser light, we fan it out, and illuminate this one scan line, and that light will come back and uh, go through a number of imaging objects, uh, optics, and then get focused onto our Linospad sensor. We also introduce a, a dichroic beam splitter here in order to pass some of the light over to our regular RGB sensor. So this RGB sensor here in the background allows us to capture intensity images of the scene, whereas our SPAD line array allows us to capture these, uh, these noisy point clouds of transient information. Now, here's an image of the scan line being generated within the scene. The camera is over here in the bottom left. You can see the lens, in fact, in this bottom left corner. And when we turn the camera on, the camera starts scanning this laser line left and right. Now, it's scanning at 20 hertz here, and it's scanning so fast that the laser line disappears when it's in motion. And this is because basically there's very little light that we're sending out into the scene around, uh, I think it was 0.1 milliwatts average power. So very, very low light. It's a little bit easier to see what's happening when we turn off the lights within the room. So here we repeat the scanning procedure, now with the ambient lights off, and you can see the laser scanning procedure in action as it scans the scene at 20 hertz. Now, this is an example of the type of information that gets produced by the system. So on the left is an intensity image that's captured from the scene using our regular camera sensor. And on the right is a transient image, once again, representing a very sparse set of photon arrival times at different points in X and Y, different spatial locations, and different instances in time T. Now, in this case, we have basically a one-to-one -one ratio between the, the signal from our laser and the ambient light that might be contributing to the, the photon noise that we're observing in this volume. And so we take these two, uh, well, we take the intensity image and this volume as input, and we attempt to produce a depth map using log match filter. 
clearly, like before, it's you get a very, very noisy result because the log match filter is a per pixel uh, approach to trying to denoise these uh, volumes. Rapid Goyal produces a much better result, but you can start to see artifacts, especially when we're dealing with dynamic scenes here. These artifacts are due to priors that uh, Rapid Goyal has uh, implemented into their algorithm, their optimization procedure, which smooths out values across the scene. And as a result, you get these blocking, this blocking nature in the, the depth map that's reconstructed. Now here's what our CNN actually outputs. So this is an example of what our CNN can produce without an intensity image. And here's how our CNN performs with an intensity image. So it does a little bit better in this case, uh, but uh, it, it works pretty well in, in both cases, uh, regardless of whether you're using an intensity image or not. Now, finally, we also use the intensity image and our third architecture to try to produce a higher resolution depth map. And so you get a much denser uh, uh, representation of the geometry within the scene, which is nice. It unfortunately also introduces some artifacts that we're currently not able to handle. So you can see there are these um, points that are flying around in the space. These are due to discontinuities between the foreground geometry and the background geometry. And when we upsample the depth maps, there's some blurring that goes on producing these flying pixels. But ignoring that, the, the rest of the scene is producing a fairly accurate geometry of the scene and uh, doing so in a very dense, uh, dense manner. So here's another scene where we cranked up the background detections a little bit more. So there's more ambient light here. And so it's a little bit harder to see what's going on here. There's a lot more ambient photons uh, corrupting the measurements. And even in this case, we can do fairly well. So again, log match filtering produces pretty noisy results. Rap and Goyal is pretty blocky. And the CNN does pretty well here. The flying pixels on the bottom right is clearly an annoyance. Um, but the denoise with intensity image in the center at the bottom does a reasonable job at reconstructing the geometry of the scene. Now here's a really extreme case. So we're doing this imaging again with a very, very, very low power laser. It's around 0.1 milliwatt average power. In fact, we could, if we went to infrared uh, and we were to crank up the, the power up to eye safety standards, we can increase the power of the laser by a factor of 1,000, just to give you an idea of how much laser power we're actually working with in this particular pr prototype. And as a result, we have a volume here, because this is being done outdoors, we have a volume here that has a lot of ambient photons. In fact, we weren't even able to measure how many ambient photons there were present here because it saturated our sensor. So there is at least 32 ambient photons present within this histogram because that's the max number of photons we can detect at the frame rate that we're operating in. Now, when we process this volume, even though it has so many ambient photons, we can actually still robustly recover the geometry within the scene pretty nicely. All right, so I want to talk about 3D sensing once again, but do so in an extreme case where you don't even have direct line of sight access to the object. So it's not just a matter of detecting a single photon coming back and trying to do something with that. You don't even have access to the object itself. And so this is an idea that was proposed in 2011, 2012, where um, uh, Andreas Velton and Ramesh Raskar, who showed you or who produced that original Coke bottle video, were able to demonstrate the ability of using this type of information to see around corners. And here's the problem statement. So on the right, um, we have a camera system that we had built um, that is imaging this object here on the left. The challenge is that there's an occluder that's separating our camera system from the object. And so there's no way to actually image this object directly. And therefore, you can't use standard algorithms and standard LIDARs to image this object because there's going to be no photons actually hitting this object directly. So instead, what we can do is we can use walls and turn them into basically diffuse mirrors in order to allow the light that's reflecting off the wall to hit an object. And we capture the light that comes back in response and use that to form 3D images of objects that are hidden from sight. 
And so the ideas present here are very similar to that of a LiDAR. So again, we use a SPAD sensor combined with a pulse laser to illuminate a scene, and we measure the time it takes for light to come back. But as opposed to a conventional LiDAR system that might have direct line of sight access to the object, here we have an occluder that might be in the way. So the goal is to use the walls that, or the surfaces that are surrounding objects and turn them into diffuse mirrors so that we can use the wall to indirectly illuminate an object and measure the light that reflects back indirectly towards the sensor. So when we do imaging in this way, we end up producing these histograms of information, just like before, these time impulse response functions captured by measuring the time it takes for individual photons to reach our sensor at different times. And in this case, this histogram will have a little bit of structure that's kind of interesting to see here. So the, is, <clears throat> excuse me, the histogram contains these two pulses. One is due to the direct reflection, which occurs at time zero. And there's a smaller pulse here that's due to the indirect light, the light that had to travel a longer distance to reach this hidden object before returning to the wall and getting detected by our sensor. Now, the time difference between when the light first arrived to the sensor due to direct reflections and the light that comes back a little bit later in time due to indirect reflections can tell us how far that object is from the wall. So the time value or the time difference between these two guys corresponds to the additional time it takes for light to travel between these two points here. So here's a live demonstration of what these histograms look like in practice. So on the right here, I have David Lindell, who's a PhD student at Stanford and I co-author on all these works, holding up this exit sign while our camera system is actually illuminating and imaging a point on a wall here. So the camera system is not looking at the exit sign directly. What the SPAD outputs in this case is this histogram representing the direct light observed at the wall, which, observe, uh, which occurs at time zero here, and the indirect light that comes a little bit later in time. And you'll notice that as David here is moving back and forth relative to the wall, the pulse here changes locations in time. Clearly, as the object appears closer to the wall, the pulse will arrive closer to time zero. And as David moves further away from the wall, the pulse will, move, uh, will take a longer time to, uh, well, the light will take a longer time to return to the wall, indicating that the pulse will arrive at a later instant in time. Now, the DC level here corresponds to the ambient light that's present within the scene. And I should uh, uh, note that the sign or the object here that we're using is a retroreflective sign. This retroreflective object uh, sends a lot more light back towards the wall. It makes it a lot easier to be able to see these signals. So imaging diffuse objects like David himself is a lot harder due to the way that the light scatters off David. These exit signs are a lot easier to scan. And while the techniques I'm going to be talking about in this part of the talk doesn't really depend on the BRDF or the reflectance function associated with these, exit, uh, these, these objects, it's a lot easier to scan these retroreflective objects. So uh, this is work that was proposed in 2012. And the challenge has been that, well, to capture the 3D shape of these objects, you again need to have this really expensive equipment and spend the full day to actually capture the measurements. But in fact, that's not the hardest part. The hardest part is actually in processing or creating the geometry here shown on the right. And so the goal of our work was not only to build a system that's able to capture the photons necessary to produce this 3D shape, but we wanted to also do this in a, a computationally efficient way. Now, in order to capture 3D shape, we need to do more than just capture this one histogram. We need to, once again, capture a transient image by, in this case, scanning different points along a wall and measuring not just the histogram from one location, but measure basically a 2D set of histograms to produce this 3D volume of information. This 3D volume represents the light that's traveling from different points on the wall to the object and back again. Now, there's an image formation model associated with this, this volume, and I'll just go through it very, very briefly here. On the bottom left, 
we have a function pal, which represents our transient image. It represents light coming back at different points, x and y on the wall, and at different instances in time. And that's related to the geometry of the hidden volume within our scene. So the function rho here is a function of x, y, and z, representing the albedo at this particular location in space. So this is a volumetric representation of the 3D geometry hidden within the scene. And these two terms are related by a radiometric term, which describes how much light is lost through the transport process, and a geometric term describing how long it takes for light to travel from one point on a wall to the object and back. Now, there are a few assumptions that are baked in here. We're assuming that there are no occlusions within the hidden volume. So that means that light travels directly from the wall to the object and back. We assume that light scatters isotropically, so we're ignoring the fact that Different materials might reflect light in different ways. And we're assuming that the wall geometry is going to be planar in this case for simplicity. Now, one nice property of this image formation model is the fact that you can simply linearize it. So it's, this is a linear model when you make these assumptions. And so you can discretize or vectorize your transient image into a vector tau, vectorize your hidden volume into a vector rho, and relate the two by a large matrix A. And so all you need to do for solving this non-line of sight problem is to solve this linear system. Great, right? Well, the challenge is that in practice, A can be extremely large. So for example, if you're trying to measure a volume that's 100 by 100 by 100, then A is already going to have a trillion elements. So that makes it far too large to basically invert directly. Despite that, this has been the approach that had been proposed by prior work. So back projection, which was initially proposed in 2012, uh, is able to compute the solution here by solving the approximation to this linear system. So instead of inverting A, they compute the transpose of A. And this requires about 10 minutes to do, and it gives you a kind of a blurry result in response. And so that they have to use uh, heuristic filters in order to sharpen the geometry. Another approach is to try to just bite the bullet and invert A directly, but this can take a lot longer on the order of hours to actually solve for an image. So we want to take a slightly different approach here. And the approach was, well, if we change the way we scan the wall, we can maybe change our image formation model into a form that's a little bit easier to deal with. Specifically, we're going to change this image formation model into one that can be solved by solving a 3D deconvolution problem. So this is first done by changing the way we scan the wall. So we can, instead of illuminating and imaging two points on the wall, which is what had been tr traditionally done in non light side imaging, we actually change the measurements to illuminate and image the same point on the wall, which simplifies the image formation model slightly. The second change is to reparameterize this image formation model. So there's a change of variables that you can perform to express this image formation model in this form. And this is a little bit complicated, so I won't go into the details on how we got to this point. But there's an important property of this equation. It's the fact that this, is, this can be expressed as basically a 3D convolution that involves a 3D volume tau, a 3D volume rho, and a 3D blur kernel A. And because this is a a convolution, we can actually come up with algorithms that are much, much faster than back projection or iterative inversion. And not only that, we're not making any approximations to the, uh, the linear system. And as a result, we get better solutions than these past methods as well. So as an example, we're able to operate in less than one second of runtime, as opposed to 10 minutes for the uh, back projection results, which produces blurry measurements or one hour for iterative inversion techniques. And the algorithm at a high level looks as follows. We take these measurements as input, these transient images, and we reparameterize these volumes. So it amounts to stretching the volume out along the time axis. And then we solve a deconvolution problem. So we take this, these measurements, we do a Fourier transform, a division in frequency space, and an inverse Fourier transform. And this is followed up by basically stretching out the results along the depth axis. This is part of the reparameterization process. And all of this can be done very efficiently in software, less than a second in MATLAB. Uh, 
And we've recently implemented this on the GPU where it takes milliseconds to operate. Our hardware system, I'll just run through this very quickly. Um, there's a sensor here, a SPAD sensor. In this case, it's a single pixel sensor. And there's some optics focusing light onto the sensor. And we have a pulse laser sending out light into the scene. So there's a beam splitter that combines the two in order to illuminate and image the same spot. And then there's a pair of mirrors that are used to control which point on the, the wall that we're actually imaging. So the laser sends out these pulses of light into the scene, and then the light comes back along the same light path in order to reach our sensor. And so we use these measurements in here in order to capture light reflecting off a wall um, in, or, in order to image this object that's hidden from sight. So in this case, our object's about 125 centimeters away from the wall. And this is what our camera actually sees. So it might be very hard to see here, but there's a laser spot that's being scanned from left to right here across the wall. Now, the reason it's hard to see is, again, we're using a 0.1 milliwatt laser average power when we have a lot of ambient light that's present within this environment. But despite that, we can still capture these point clouds of information or these transient images. And if we slice it up along the time axis, the signal that you're observing here is due to that hidden object. So I'll just show it and play it back one more time. There's these ripples of light due to light traveling from the wall to the object and back again. And by using this deconvolution procedure, we can reconstruct the 3D shape of this object quite quickly. So this takes about one second in MATLAB to actually produce the image on the right here. So this was done outdoors where we didn't have very good control over um, all our environmental factors like ambient light. So we also tried to do this indoors where uh, we had a number of different objects. Um, let me run this. So here we have a mannequin. Uh, we painted it with a little bit of retroflective paint just to make it easier to scan. And you can see a lot more clearly the streaks or these ripples of light that are traveling through the scene. And by processing this volume, we can recover the geometry of this mannequin, again, very, very quickly. Here's an example of an exit sign that we also scanned. This is the same exit, scan, uh, exit sign that David was holding up when uh, we're showing off the raw histograms captured for non-line side imaging. And uh, here's a comparison between a variety of different methods. So back projection and filtered back projection were the initial approach to solving this, uh, this non-line site problem. And not only does it give you poor results, uh, meaning that you can't even read out the letters on this exit sign, um, but it takes about 10 minutes to produce these results. Whereas by expressing this problem as a convolution problem, we can solve this very, very quickly one second in software, milliseconds in, on a GPU. And we can also incorporate priors to help us denoise or uh, improve the results even further. Um, so I'm going to skip over this, but it's basically an iterative convolution procedure that takes advantage of the speed of our convolution procedure. And we use that in order to combine it with priors in order to produce a better result. Here's another example. And here's the final example that I'd like to show off. So in this case, this object is diffuse. So it doesn't have this retroreflective material property that makes it easier to scan. And so as a result, the data is a lot noisier. Um, in this case, we take about an hour to scan this information using a very low power light source. And you can see here that our deconvolution procedure still does pretty well. But here, by taking advantage of priors, we can do a lot better. Uh, so it helps us really denoise uh, this volume a lot better than just the conventional deconvolution procedure. And uh, recently, we've been actually taking these devices on the road with us. So here's an example of the device that we, fab uh, we built and brought to CVPR and SIGGRAPH this past summer. And this device allows us to capture these objects that are moving, uh, even though the camera here does not see the object directly. We can reconstruct the object. If you look closely on this, this monitor here on the bottom right, um, we're able to reconstruct these objects at a rate of 2 hertz. So I'll just uh, like to leave off and uh, make a few concluding remarks here. Uh, and I hope that I gave you an idea of what these spads can do and how can they change the way we see the, see the world. So these spads have a number of different applications. 
one of the main applications that I focused on for today is its use in capturing the 3D shape of objects in very hard to deal with scenarios. So scenarios where you have lots of ambient light or you have an occluder that's in the way. And these spads are able to, from very few photon counts, process the information in order to capture the 3D shape of these objects in these very, very hard to deal with uh, situations. However, 3D imaging is just one potential application for these SPADs. And uh, there are many different areas in which SPADs can be used. It's currently being used in microscopy, for example, to image the uh, fluorophores um, that will emit light at different instances in time. And this is called fluorescence lifetime imaging. And so SPADs is a, a critical piece of equipment for that particular application. And we're also exploring the use of SPADs to understand material appearance in more detail. So um, I hope I gave you a, an understanding of the basics of SPADs and single photon imaging and how it can be used in a variety of different applications. And with that, I'll, I'll conclude my talk um, with just uh, acknowledging the, that this work was done in collaboration with David and Gordon out of Stanford University. This is also work that I did when I was doing my postdoc there. And uh, I'll leave it at that. And I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have at this time. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Pretty cool. So, questions? Uh, yeah, very impressive work. Um, so, it seems that combining your CNN depth estimation with the technique by Rapp and Goyado seems to work very well. Are there situations where both fail and you cannot fill in the gaps? Yeah, so there are challenges uh, clearly when you reduce the photon counts even lower. So there are going to be limits on how much information you can actually pull out uh, when you have maybe 0.1 photons arriving uh, per pixel. And uh, so there's, uh, there are clearly limits on how far you can push these algorithms. We're still trying to explore where those limits are. Um, so by fusing intensity images with the SPAD data, uh, we can push these algorithms a little bit further. But I think there's still work to be done to try to get these works, uh, the sensors to work even better. And this is important in order to get LiDAR systems, for example, to see further along the road or operate at higher speeds or at higher resolutions. Okay. Thanks. Any more questions? Uh, yes. So for the uh, exit sign you have shown uh, on the last slides, you, uh, you have not only seen the shape of the sign but also the text. I guess That's right. Because of the different uh, reflectiveness of the white color and the black color on the on the sign. Yeah. So. Yeah. Let me show you my screen again here. Now, the, what we're capturing is not just the 3D shape. The algorithm is actually producing a volume of information where that volume represents albedo. So that volume will also encode texture variations, for example, on the exit sign. So parts of the exit sign, which are black, will have small albedos, which is the reason why we can see it in this in this volume here. The white areas will produce uh, uh, basically a reflection and will light up only in specific areas within this volume. So in fact, if you wanted to get a mesh of the geometry of this exit sign, you would have to take this 3D volume representing albedos and textures and then process it uh, in order to pull out a mesh representing the exit sign. So that's why we can capture not just the shape of the exit sign, but the, the lettering on the exit sign as well. Oh, thanks. More questions? I would have one question related to this. To this. So this means you would see the difference, but what's the difference between, for example, a black letter on your exit sign and, and a hole? Good question. So. It's very difficult to distinguish between having an exit sign where the letters are cut out and having an exit sign where you just have a black material there. And in fact, I would expect that you would get the exact same result in both situations in this particular case. 
And that's because it's very hard to distinguish between, uh, and, and this applies to uh, many or almost all situations where you have a black object. If that object does not reflect any light, it's really hard to detect whether there's just a hole there or the object's just not reflecting light back at you. Now, there may be ways to overcome that. For example, if there's a wall behind the exit sign, maybe that information can be used to distinguish between whether the exit sign has holes in it or whether it's just black lettering. But that is a very tricky situation to try to, uh, that's a very hard thing to try to figure out. Yes, there's always a CNN that can do. Any other questions? But I had a question, an understanding question, um, in terms of the capturing of the transient images. Um, you mentioned that you use a 1D array of spats that gives you a 1D image plus time. Um, and the other spatial direction is scanned by scanning uh, your laser, right? Yeah. So how did you, exactly that slide, how do you get that image recorded with the optical fibers then? Right, so this is a, a repetitive process. So every scan line, we send uh, a pulse through the optical fiber and repeat the measurements. So even though um, we're not capturing the light propagating through the fiber in real time, the reason we can reconstruct this transient image is because it's a repetitive process regardless of where the scan line is. So um, each scan line, again, is capturing this spatial temporal image uh, where one axis represents, uh, corresponds to the y-axis in this image on the right, and the other axis represents time. And then we scan the scene by moving a mirror in front of our sensor uh, from left to right. So the mirror controls where our sensor is receiving light from. And uh, because the light propagating through the fiber is repetitive, so we can send out a pulse through the fiber every time for every scan line. Um, in fact, we're sending out millions of pulses per second through the fiber. We get a transient image, which represents light propagating through the fiber um, at these transient scales. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that makes it clear. I didn't get that that you actually do that a couple of times. I thought you do that with a single laser pulse that you send through the optical fiber. And then right, saying. right. So uh, just to make it super clear, so these spads only detect a single photon. And so every time you're working with these spads, you have to repeat the process millions of times a second in order to capture these histograms of information. So as a result, by, uh, by definition, you have to have this uh, ability to periodically send light into the scene and just capture new measurements. Uh, in this case, uh, representing photons that might have taken different light paths, but if you're scanning, it's the same process. You're sending out lots of different pulses of light over time through the scene and then uh, counting basically the number of photons arriving at different times at the sensor. Mm -hmm. So the other question I had is that the resolution of your sensor depends on the wavelength, I guess, right? The wavelength of your laser source. Could you expand on that? that I, I assume that the resolution of the SPAT sensor depends on the wavelength of the laser source that you use. That you use. We are dealing with monochromatic lasers, only we one laser source. We are dealing with monochrom uh, monochromatic light, um, but it's not necessarily limited by, it is not at all limited by the wavelength that we're working with. So the wavelength of light, in fact, can be whatever you want. Um, so we, we use red and we use blue lasers throughout this project. So the little spad actually we paired up with blue light. The MPD spad we paired up with red light. Um, and there is an effect on uh, the temporal resolution of these sensors. Yeah. Um, so blue light, in fact, doesn't give you as good of a response, temporally speaking, as red light for reasons that are beyond me. It has to do with how the photons are absorbed by the sensor. Um, 
But other than that, there's really no dependency on Wavelength. Um, so it, it basically acts like a, a regular uh, CMOS sensor or CCD sensor. It, it's sensitive to a variety of wavelengths and you don't necessarily lose temporal resolution uh, when operating red or green. Now, as I said, there's some caveats when it comes to blue light. If you go below 450 nanometers, for example, then the temporal resolution will decrease due to some uh, physics associated with uh, how the blue light interacts with the SPAD sensor. But other than that, there's no dependency. But that effect would also have an effect on the depth resolution. So, um, can you repeat that one more time? I said if you have an effect on the temporal resolution due to the wavelength, would that affect the depth resolution? Absolutely. So, uh, let's see here. So these two spads, for example, are, are the two spads that we use throughout the project. So the, the line array on the right and the MPD spad on the left. And they have different characteristics when it comes to time stamping these photons. So on the left, you have about 60 picoseconds jitter, meaning that there's some electronic noise associated when, with how the time stamp is associated with that photon. And as a result, you get this full with half max associated with um, the pulse. So the pulse in this case, if we were to measure it with this sensor, will look, uh, it will look like it's about 1.8 centimeters in length. And so that means that your depth resolution, your depth accuracy is going to be around that order. Now, if you use a different SPAD, which has higher uh, jitter, 300 picoseconds in this case, it's also going to lower the accuracy in your depth maps because there's more uncertainty in when the photons actually struck your pixel. So there's more jitter, meaning that the pulses effectively uh, are wider, and that corresponds to a lower uh, depth resolution. OK, the last question I had was on the, on the last project. Um, you mentioned that you used 3D convolution um, to remove basically the ambient um, noise part. And you mentioned that that is done in your case by division of frequency domain. I was wondering why you don't get more artifacts. I mean, 3D deconvolution or deconvolution in general is hard to do. If you do it with a simple division of frequency domain, it normally would give you lots of artifacts when you do inverse Fourier transformation. Um, yeah, you're, that's a great question. Um, in fact, the, uh, you can show that the Fourier transform of this particular kernel um, is actually non-zero uh, for all frequency coefficients. So the, the division in some ways is very well defined. Um, but in addition to that, we also do um, uh, a Wiener filtering. It's not a straight division. Um, so we're assuming that there is some um, white noise that's present in our measurements. And there's a scalar that we control to uh, control just how sensitive do we want to be to the noise that's present there. So what I said here was we do a straight up division and that's not quite accurate. I should have said that we're actually doing a Wiener filtering. Uh, so we're using uh, a version of the division uh, that is uh, basically implicitly making use of priors on the noise characteristics associated with our measurements. Okay, Wiener filtering is quite different to different the division. That's right. Okay, that makes it clear too. I have no other questions. Are you having more? Then thank you. Thank you very much again. It was very interesting and inspiring. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. <clears throat> okay. Thank you for coming. The next talk is next month. I don't remember. Yes. Do you remember the date? I sent you an email. Mm -hmm. the that we have already and the next talk will also be remote talk